Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this was the Cloud 2030 March 4th discussion where we went all over the place with enterprise architecture, cloud, uh, data center, or private cloud, public cloud, if people are right or wrong to do any of that stuff. And we ended up with a really uh, passion, com passionate conversation about enterprise architecture and if it exists anymore and is even practical and a whole bunch of things along the way. Enjoy this great conversation. So I have a question. This kind of comes from last week. So there's all the discussion about the growth of public cloud services, but just as a sanity check, I looked at the Equinix stock and um, it's currently like 14% below its minimum and as high as like $942 a share. And the growth rate is like at a 45% angle over the next 12 months. So as a CNN money forecast. So there seems to be this difference between, you know, if, if the public cloud is growing so quickly, why are the data center stock looking so good? Or the data center growth? Oh. Anecdotally, I hear so much about co-location data center growth, but it seems to be that conflict to, private, to public cloud growth. No. Um, no, I don't see it as a conflict at all, Rick. Um, so a couple of things, and you know, this came up. This came up in a group. A group actually here in Southern California. Um, there were there were some folks that were talking about. Um, by the way, how how far does this recording go? Get published. Uh, it goes to my podcast, but we can mute and stop. I'm happy to do that if you want. You want me to pause it? Can you? Yeah. Comments that I had made last week related to this, but I was kind of dancing around it because I didn't want to divulge and, too and many I think, details to protect you know, the innocent. I, I, I mean, and and we're seeing we're on the front tip of this, right? We are seeing customers who um, are cloud savvy, who are looking are are, are looking for repatriation, or looking for a more heterogeneous mix. So, right, there's two, there's two stories. One is the story of saying, hey, we're, we're giving up on the cloud thing. Um, and there's another, there's another story of, I want my infrastructure to mix to be more heterogeneous. There are places where I want control and I have a stable enough base load that I can put it in co-location. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would be amazed to see enterprise data centers like on campus, you know, raised floor inside of a that that strikes me as silly. Um, the real estate, like mixing your real estate so that you have your own data center space inside of a regular retail campus. Um, With everybody. I, the only the only reason I could see doing it is for a test lab. I, I can't see it for a, a real computational system because the you know, Equinix's cross interconnect story and any of these providers, their interconnect story with cloud infrastructure is a real is a real value proposition. And you know, just to Rick, you know, just to follow up on Rick's note, um, observation about the respective growth in both cases, they are not one stealing one stealing from the other. They're both in in growth mode. And yeah, really interesting figure to pull together would be to understand where what is happening in the cloud MSP market. Because there you're sitting there, you're sitting with folks that are pulling, you know, are quote repatriating, but they're but they may be repatriating not back to their own data center, but rather to a managed data center or managed service that's supporting them with hybrid, taking away a lot of their operational, you know, kind of overhead and, and maintenance, which was one of the reasons why they were encouraged to move to cloud in the first place. Right. Now they found, a, you know, an appropriate middle ground. And yes. you know, to, the, to, the, to the point that they get, um, you know, truly involved in, with hybrid situations that are specific to their applications where they've got um, specialized kinds of data replication. They have to manage that, have to figure out where. Um, 
business continuity, and quite frankly, um, geographic distribution and jurisdictional um, distribution. I think all of those fit into the kinds of encouragement. So it's not one, there isn't a, there isn't a conservation of, of compute requirement that's going on in the universe. It's, uh, it's basically, it's all growing. It's growing at, at pretty incredible rates and people yeah. are finding the appropriate mix of cloud only, hybrid and um, kind of off, off cloud, where off cloud could be a variety of solutions. Well, I, I suspect and I hope a lot of this on-premises migration is going to co-location data center facilities as opposed to what Rob was saying, like on campus. I can't imagine anybody thinking that building a new on-campus data center is a reasonable... And I, and, and I would say that just looking at Equinix, NTT, uh, Digital Realty, who are the bigs and Colo, and then, you know, they, it's not the seven dwarfs, it's probably the seven, 70 or 700 dwarfs that are in the, in the Colo business after that. Um, the reason for their growth and the reason for the you're noticing the, the growth of, of Equinix and, and the rest is exactly that. They are pulling back off cloud, but they're pulling it back into colo and, and rented managed data centers. So that leads so to as part of this migration, are they migrating to, to private cloud? I mean, private cloud is a thing, but I, I'm kind of curious if they're migrating to a private cloud well, when you say private cloud, what do you mean, Rick? Because there, that covers <laughs> that covers a multitude of sins. Yeah, there's no there's no standard definition for private cloud. That's why I always laugh when people say private versus public because there's no standard for private. So how he, how can you compare that? Yeah, and I think there's a big difference between good cloud and quote bad cloud. I don't think. <laughs> quote, quote, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna push you on that one too. <laughs> What's, yeah. what's bad cloud? What do you mean when you say that? Well, so by by private cloud, I mean heavily virtualized, like virtualized everything, like getting to the software as a as a data um, data center as a software software defined data center. Okay, and and I, uh, mm. well, hmm. Yeah, I'm assuming you don't mean in the VMware terms, just because that's a VMware marketing term. So I want to be careful. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Be it contained. Yeah, I mean API API driven infrastructure. Um, this this I think is what I consider the post, you know, the post cloud phase of this, um, where cloud is the idea that only the hyperscalers can build API driven infrastructure and the post cloud phase is, you know, this is the way we just do computing. And so it's, it's baked in is the, that's the way I see it. Rich is shaking his head. So maybe. I don't, um, I don't buy that. Um, okay. If you, let's go back to <clears throat> uh, folks like um, digital realty and um, Cushman Wakefield and CBRE these are companies that are you know basically buying and building class a office buildings they are actually as they're being built they're working with companies to actually put in place a an infrastructure for their tenants such that when the tenant moves in you know it's all there they're they want VPN. They want a direct. They want direct lines to Amazon. Great. There's a local that is a metropolitan data center that's associated with a lot of these buildings, possibly two, because of business continuity. And they're moving up the the food chain 
to the point where they're doing a lot of local, if you want to call metropolitan or in building data retention. They are talking to and working with customers who, depending on whether they're single tenant or multi tenant um, setups, are pulling in. In some cases, they're they're talking. OpenShift, they're talking VMware, they're talking a lot of them. It is not, it, it, it's not as though they're abandoning, well, they are tending to, I think, refrain from going to Amazon's, for example, um, you know, outpost type of approach mm. because you know, one of the things that I think Tim has referenced here is that a lot of these very same companies who are talking about repatriation, they're still using Amazon in some cases for a lot of yeah. their, their analytics, but they don't like Outpost for a very simple reason. And that is all the controls, you know, the, the hands on the controls are, you know, in Amazon, not with their own, not with their own IT organization. It sounds a lot like the old days back with ISPs with PSI net and UU net and metro area networks and yeah, dare, dare I channel um, uh, the ghosts of McNeely and Benioff where they, the cloud is the network at this point. The cloud is but Mike, the this is but again, you know, if you think about it, there's a generational piece, I think, that is yeah. playing a, a serious role in this. Um, yeah. Now, I if we look at the the other extreme and I keep thinking about, OK, so how does this apply to cloud 2030 and, and what that might look like and how we can help guide folks along that journey? The opposite extreme is also not. Um, appropriate either, right? The all in, all cloud. And I think, you know, Tealy kind of talked to this recently in a post where he talked about how, um, you know, that really did a disservice, which we all knew. We all knew from the get up that that was, you know, that was a bad idea. But there's, there's something in the middle. There's a happy middle. And that happy middle place is different for each organization based on a number of factors, right? Yeah. There isn't, so, one, there isn't one way station between all all on prem and all all you know all correct. On but the other thing I'm the other thing is for different situations I'm not even sure that that a cloud first um, mentality is necessarily the right way to kind of frame your thinking and to bring it together. Meaning, it's just. <sighs> On one hand, I'll say, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Cloud is the single biggest opportunity for enterprises, full stop. However, that being said, I think it's important to understand how to best use it as a tool and where it best fits. And so what are some of those guiding principles that help your specific organization understand what makes sense for public cloud, what makes sense for private cloud, what makes sense for that has no business uh, in cloud. And so what are those different, um, those different criteria or those discussions you have to go through? And this kind of goes full circle back to what Rick was bringing up, which is where does Colo fit into this? Where does your corporate data center fit into it? Especially as we think about that edge to cloud continuum I think it's important to to have a serious conversation. Again, every company is going to be different, but what are the criteria that they should be thinking through to say, you know what, these pieces need to sit at the edge. These pieces sit at this point in the middle, this point in the middle, this point in the middle, this point in public cloud. You know, how do you go through that process? And I think that would be a uh, healthy exercise um, in guidance for organizations, but that's just my so two pennies. No, I, I I agree with what you're saying, sort of. Um, that because we're help. I mean, we're we're in the middle of these conversations with customers who are 
incredibly successful cloud companies. Um, cloud users. Cloud users, like like renowned cloud using companies. Yeah. Um, and the the thing, this is why I, I consider it post cloud, because Tim, the the challenge with what you're saying, which I strongly agree with, is that companies have to take an assessment of of their their infrastructure requirements. And then the challenge that they get into is if they start looking at them as silos of infrastructure, where it's like, okay, edge is its own thing. My, my colo stuff is its own thing and cloud is its own thing. And oh shoot, wait, these three different clouds that each have their own stuff. That becomes an untenable situation for these companies. Um, yeah. And I, I think that you're seeing what we're talking around is the, the reaction to all right, if I want to be all in on, on if I want to use Amazon because I'm accelerated, my teams want to use it, it's fast, it's easy, there's these great services, totally right. Then they get they get locked in and they're like, okay, wait a second, it's actually really expensive infrastructure. If it's a base load, I could run it myself, right? We're talking to companies that have huge VDI footprints that are pretty constant VDI footprints. Um, because you got to look at what the workloads are, or they're they're doing they're looking at real edge stuff where they 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 have, you know, a captive workload to do their their process, their inventory, warehouse processing, all that stuff, video. Um, well, our, the challenge that they, they get is that they 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 can't afford for it to be silos of stuff. That's yeah. the to me the, but, the challenge. But aren't you just saying in a different way that this is a top down determination? It's like, what do I need this for? What are my business processes? What have I already bought into? For example, the VDI and and you know, at what point did you know I build out my build out the the application configurations in my IT estate? What do I want to move it to? It is, it, yeah, you're you're right. You're right in saying. I can't think of these things as silos. And by doing it that way, it's, it's you know, I, I, I'm not thinking about the constituency. I'm not thinking about right. the users as, as customers for my IT operation. You know, this is, this is IT as a product as opposed, what you're driving at is IT as a product. If I, if I think about it that way, and I'm dealing with, you know, hmm. here's here's the here's the constituency. Here's who uses it. Here's who feeds into it. It is very context dependent. And if I if I go at it that way, then I don't generally end up with oh, it's all edge. It's all on prem. It's all one thing or another. You don't get siloed. Well, I maybe guess, maybe part of what we're talking about is the OT, the shift of OT versus IT, right? We've spent the last 10 years letting letting individual business orgs bottom up. And maybe this is your tops down, bottoms up thing. Bottoms up say, I need this, I need this, I need this. I'm going to go get it done and everything's great. But the lack of controls on that has made it, you know, very hard to cost optimize, very hard to manage, very hard to secure. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, IT is is really the the per, the pendulum on that, um, where we're saying, hey, we we actually need consistency and controls and cost management. Um, yeah. So so I'm I'm I want to go back to something you said, Rob, um, and it kind of goes to the the look of bottoms up versus top down. So if you go bottoms up, you run the risk of looking at it in a very siloed way, right? Yeah. Because you're looking, okay. and, and my thinking behind yeah, this that's is- that's right. That's exactly look, where the silos come from. That's right. Right. So, you know, you could look at it, um, and when I say bottoms up, I, what I'm talking about is you could be looking at it for a server, replace a server or a resource, a physical resource. You could be looking at it as replacing a physical application. Um, but if you're looking at it from an infrastructure perspective going up, you run into this concern around silos. My, mm -hmm. my hesitation on that is it doesn't take into account the holistic opportunity 
that exists when you think about that entire continuum, nor does it necessarily get us to uplevel the conversation to say, why are we doing this? So it's not just replacing one for one or one from, for a better one, but rather maybe we should just replace it all together or sunset it. You, you don't get into those kinds of, of tough conversations necessarily when you're looking at it from that, that infrastructure perspective. And I think part of that is we've done a disservice within the IT organization of building organizations that are very much infrastructure or applications or operational, uh, operationally focused. What I mean by that is that if we're replacing something, we wanna replace it with something else. We don't wanna necessarily give it up because there's kind of this thiefdom that, that gets built organizationally. Um, and there's a concern about how we manage headcount and, and skill sets and, and the rest. It tends to be very structured. And so when you going back full circle back to having that conversation about replacing one for one, you're just promulgating that same kind of mentality as opposed to up leveling the conversation, maybe more of a top down approach and saying, okay, is this the right way to do it? Maybe we need to just completely push it aside or do it completely <laughs> differently. Or maybe we do replace it with something something uh, more like. So let me let me ask you this Tim then. Is what you if I'm hearing you correctly, and there's more than a zero chance that I'm not hearing you correctly, um, are you you know, there's don't build there's no infrastructure underneath it, right? There's no foundation and you just build based on what the we I mean we have to build on something, right? You have to build on some sort of foundation. So <clears throat> IT has to agree on whatever that's going to be. Well, I think that's I, I think that's kind of the the point of so so back up. It, it's a great question, but but back up for a second. If you're just looking at replacing a, a core fundamental piece of infrastructure, I think the piece that you're missing is is you're, you're looking at it in a context that is specific to whatever bounds your, your focal point is. So if it's that server, if it's that particular data center, if it's that particular um, infrastructure staff, that is the constraint. And so you're looking to replace that one aspect without necessarily considering the other tangible aspects that it touches out to. And that's, that's the piece that I worry about is it gets too far into the weeds that we kind of miss. I, sh I should really not get too close to the camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to lean in. But um, it's, it gets too, too close to the problem. And I think that we could really have some healthy discussion if we just pulled back a little bit and said, okay, can we look at the big picture and how this fits into the big picture? You know, it kind of goes back to um, it goes back to this concept of you know how we got here and the things that got us here are not going to get us there and how and part of that is not but, just technology. Part of it's thinking and organization. Well, I it, and uh, well, between go ahead, Rich. between thinking and organization and you know IT architecture, you know, there's there's an approach that says you know, I think to Mike's question or Mike's kind of statement that you know it sounds as though you're being kind of dismissive about a foundation or building on foundations and i think that logically the kinds of architectures that you use here need to be domain driven or context driven both you know who's who's throwing data and 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 questions and and the raw resources into the IT organization, and who among, in, in a business are the consumers, the, the end users of that. And when you start thinking about it as domain-oriented or domain-defined, almost immediately, a particular architectural design pattern or foundational design pattern kind of recommends itself. It might be cloud, it might be 
uh, uh, huh. an MSP, it might be some something else. There are middle grounds. There are places where you can kind of start with, you know, it, it's what enterprise architecture philosophies are supposed to do and generally never do besides, you know, drawing pretty pictures. But um, <laughs> they... <laughs> Wow, I don't, I don't, I, I don't you're, have, you're 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 triggering wow. me, but keep keep finish your thought because well, I I, I, I want to add something. I guess my point here is logical architectures, in, infrastructures, do get illuminated by starting at the the domains of responsibility, the contexts in which you know this stuff is being built, and being being built, being driven the inputs to it and then being consumed Can, the, so let me just add one thing rob before okay, just to clarify sure. and then go on to back to what mike was saying and even what rich had added in i'm not suggesting that you don't determine the foundation of course it's everything's built on a foundation i'm i'm not questioning that what i'm questioning is how you determine the right foundation and do you look at it myopically to say foundation for application x versus y versus z or do you look at the broader context and say okay x and y use this z and a use this so i'm just saying if you were if you talking just start about, with if you were talking about building a house or a building Pam, wouldn't you say all right how permanent does this need to be? What do I have to plan? What's the time horizon over which I need to amortize what my investment, you know, deal with changes in it? You'd be sitting there going, you know, I better not use wood on this because as the, the basic framing structure, because I may have to put more than three stories on it. I may need to uh, not lay in a, a cement slab because there are things that might require me to get into and actually build a sub basement. Uh, there are there are approaches that you would take based on your initial set of uh, requirements and the time horizon for which you're building, wouldn't you say? Housing is a great housing is a great way to look at it, right? Am I am uh, I building? Does my business but, need a house? Does my business need a, an apartment building? But but here's but or here's the dilemma. Give, and give people tents. But here, wait wait but but here's the dilemma, and we see this right. We are in the front lines here with what with what Racken's doing with helping customers and trying to get into the mix with this. Mm -hmm. Because we're dealing with companies that have enterprise and colo data centers have cloud stuff, right? Mike, the, the problem is, and is that there, the idea of an enterprise architect coming in and laying the foundations before any of this stuff is built is it's fantasy at this point. The, the, the technologies that are getting spun up here are, are getting spun up as tents, right? People are, this, this is what we see. People are like, all right, I've got, I'm, I, I have, I need to solve a problem. I'm going to go camping in the wilderness. I'm going to put up a tent. It looks good. I build a frontier village. And all of a sudden you're, you've got your, you know, now you've got your highway, you know, trucked through that frontier village uh, because it was providing value and nobody that you, you, you don't get to pull that back in. Right. When we, when we talk I'm to sorry, customers, when you, say you don't get to pull it back in. What's that mean? You don't get to pull it back into your enterprise architecture, right? The, 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 the thing that we see as the biggest challenge in any of these organizations is that you have to meet them where they are, right? You, you, they, they don't get to say, you know, what? I really want to start using Dell servers, but I've been a Cisco shop just switch over to use the Dell servers. You got to get the Cisco, so, right? right the, the, so the, whole, the whole thing is part of the, the deal. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you, Rob, because Please. if, and, and the reason I say that is because if I were CEO of Rackin, I totally would be with you. Go to where the customer is, yeah. but I'm, I'm not. And so I'm looking at the bigger picture to say there are some 
sacred cows that, that we have to take out back and shoot. And maybe one of those, and I'll, I'll be really provocative here, maybe one of those is this concept of enterprise architecture. And in the, con in the context <laughs> of how it's done today, you so, you and I are actually agreeing with you, with with you because what because I I don't I think that the idea of of expecting that you're going to reel everything back in and make it a shining pillar of of uniform IT conformance is a dead concept. Like no. cloud killed that part of part of cloud is the idea that your IT is actually composed of frontier villages, and 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 the 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 challenge we have today is actually figuring out how to migrate a, a, a frontier town into the city or bolster it so that it actually has the infrastructure it needs to be successful. It's, it's not a, um, you know, when I say meet somebody as they are, you're not doing it to say, hey, it's great, you should stay here. What we're trying to do is saying, look, you've solved this problem. You don't get to kill the cow because the cow's producing milk. You have to bring another cow in or provide another source of milk, and 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 migrate it right. We're it, and this is the the IT. The reason we're in this mix is because IT was so slow and was so good at saying no. People just said screw that. They went to vendors who said I'll sell I'll sell you milk because IT won't sell. You know, is like I we will sell you the milk. Problem. Yeah, right. we won't do it. But and so now we've we've created a model, and it's the right model. I'm not asking us to change the model, it's not even practical too. I think one of my lessons from 2030, consistently across the board, complexity is here to stay, we've made it cheap, right? CapEx spending is here to stay, we've, made, we've, we've built our innovation models around it, right? Service providers are here to stay, it's, it's, it's how you start a project because you don't wanna build all the infrastructure or get the budget. We've, we have changed the, you know, in, in for positive reasons and for potentially negative ones, we've changed the equation it takes to build something up. And at the same time, we are coming in sweeping up behind the elephants and saying, wait a second, this is costing me a lot of money because it's running in cloud, in expensive cloud infrastructure, or, I, you know, I have all this legacy stuff. I can't keep managing it the old way because it's super expensive. I need to manage it the new way. That, that's Once where Rackham gets involved. you're talking about what is your time horizon? What's your time? What's your, what are you thinking about in terms of time? And time horizons don't always go forward. You also have to look at what you, what you've just been through, and what yeah. you, what you've invested. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me hurt your ears once before I, I, um, shut up. And that is going back to the building analogy. I don't know if you have been involved with really big construction projects as well as building a house or building a, you know, or renovating a, you know, um, remodeling no. a house. No. There's a reason why, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a reason why when you are building a big building, who drives the story? It is the engineering organization that drives it. They have to figure out how to make, you know, everything fit. It's got to be, it's, they've got to deal with its safety, its longevity, everything else. You build a house, you get an architect. Architects are not engineers, they're architects. The reason is architects live and die by the fact that they've got a lot of well-defined, predefined modules that they put together. A two by four is a two by four is a two by four. Yeah. They use and design houses from modules that they know can be acquired, can be built, can be found from multiple sources, but they're constrained by that. And some, some architects, mm -hmm. if they go beyond it, they, they build, you know, uh, some pretty amazing things, except they leak when it rains. But, you know, the, the point here is these are different skills. And there's a point where architects are not the right people to drive the story. There is an engineering component and there is a time component that has to be brought into this. Right. 
I'll shut up. Like, like the architecture, if you go to any co-location, this is based on years of experience, and you look at all the cages, and just in my own personal estimate, I'd say 10% of the cages look like they were architected and designed. We built that way from the very beginning. 90% of them look like they're built ad hoc, like a router's thrown over here, a server's thrown over here, and there's no design. It is just ugly. Are they, are they of, are, Rick, are they architected or were they just kind of filled out? You know, were they slots that got, you know, are they racks where you just, people started throwing whatever, you know, the vendors sold them? Yep, and it goes to utilization. Like a good, a, a good metric for good IT versus bad IT is total resource utilization. Like how much total CPU are you using? How much total, you know, 90% utilization of storage are you using? So, you know, a lot of, uh, I bet right now, I think when, People start talking about cloud, they're saying that resource utilization is more like 20% of all the IT hardware. And cloud are maybe got us up to 40%. But I think it was architected very well. You can get resource utilization of every component of the architecture up to 60, 70%. But I think but cloud Rick, is driving Rick, let me push okay. let me push back on that a second, that that premise for a second, because I've heard this argument before. And Yes, IT runs at low utilization, but there are reasons for that. It's because, I mean, in a nutshell, it's because you never want to get to a situation where you hit you hit a peak that goes over 100% capacity and then services are all of a sudden unavailable and you've got users banging on your door. Let's be honest, people get fired for that. So. What you do is you run at a lower utilization, assume what your peak is, put some extra buffer in there. And that's why you see, and historically why you've seen um, internal IT orgs that are not scalable, that run at low utilization. It's because of that supply and demand and, and understanding the politics that go alongside it. But set that aside for a minute. Rick, if we could leverage 40% utilization, 70% utilization. Have we really solved the, the core issue or, or what have we necessarily solved? Uh, cost for one thing, like you pointed out that a lot of this, a lot of um, EIOs, the primary concern is cost. So the higher the resource utilization, the lower the, the cost. Higher the resource utilization, the lower the cost. Uh, the, 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 that's not quite. That's a weird, it's, it's not always, that's, it's, it, it seems like a simple truism, but I, I think that the costs are not just the consumption of the resource. No, a lot I think, of it is the I think control and management and risk and governance. It's just one component, but I've seen it's like I, the one, it's just one metric. There's one metric I've seen that's been done pretty poorly. Yeah, I think what, Rick, what you're trying to say is that if you have a higher utilization rate, then the cost per unit of consumption is lower. Right. Which, which is true, right? So right. if you spend $100,000 and you're consuming it at 20%, well, that $100,000 has to be amortized across the 20% of, of consumption. If you're consuming it at 40%, well, guess what? Your cost per unit of consumption just dropped in half. Right. So I think that's what you're trying to say, right? Yes. I think there's a direct correlation between resource utilization and good architecture. Uh, well, hmm. let's put it this way. If you want to talk about infrastructure that is probably consistently best you utilized in other words they're they're pulling as much out of it on a consistent basis as they're likely to get i would point to gcp their their un, their underlying infrastructure which is very purpose built for themselves runs generally in the 70 to 80% utilization as a cloud, as a cloud infrastructure, that's damn good. Yeah. But what you're talking about, Rick, when you talk about utilization and 
costs. I think you're mixing, you're, you're kind of throwing in two metrics that are very closely related to one another. They're not, they're not a, they're not a dual. So utilization is usually how much of this infrastructure for which I've paid good money, which I'm continuing to pay good money, recurring costs to keep running, am I using and do, am I getting economies of scale out of it? If you Correct. told me that's your measure, okay, yeah. I'm a little bit easier with what you've just said. Well, maybe a better, a better metric or a better description is cost efficiency. Fine. You know, that's a... Yeah, but, but this is the challenge I have with that, that as a statement is that if you look at, if you use utilization as your measure for, for any of the IT functions, which I, we, we, is, is there's a, there's a tendency to want to do, I think it really misses the exact things that we were describing as the enterprise architectural costs, right. because you can, you can end up with a system that's incredibly efficient. Yay. But can't yeah, be migrated the right or job. moved or supported but, or. But Rob, this is, this is the reality. Go back to, to where we started in this call and, and conversations that I've had just in hmm. the last month or so of folks that do believe that they can do things more efficiently on-prem as opposed to in cloud. Now, I but you're but efficiency is not mm -hmm. I wouldn't say the right word. They're under more control. They can be more effective. They they think they might be able to save money as a total cost. I suspect they they don't think they're running a more efficient system than Amazon is doing. Right. There's, I don't think that. So, I mean, to be fair, I don't think that. I think you're giving them more credit than they deserve. Okay. Um, I'm just going to be candid That's because fine. I don't think there's enough um, consideration. The folks that, the folks that I've had conversation, deeper conversations with that hit over the years that are moving workloads from public cloud back to on-prem um, because of cost, it's because of a knee-jerk reaction to the bill and seeing that that cost of mm -hmm. um, that feels more expensive than what they could do internally. What they're not doing is breaking it down to understand that A, they're probably consuming more resources than they had on-prem. B, they're not using those resources efficiently. Right. C, they're not re-architecting the application to effectively use those services. And then D, they're not thinking about the value they're getting from it. They're looking at it very myopically of, you know, a server cost me five grand, cloud cost me 10 grand. And so it's double the expense. I'm making up those numbers, but it's double the expense. And so I can do it cheaper on-prem. What they, what they don't then think about is A, are all of those numbers kind of, are you all in on the numbers, meaning you've got a true apples to apples comparison? Typically not, I will say from experience. But then yeah. the second piece is, they're absolutely not thinking about value in here. So if I'm spending a million dollars a month on cloud, and that's get, gaining me 5 million in top line revenue, why in the hell aren't we talking about growing that spend from 1 million to 100 million and getting 500 million in revenue assuming it plays out from an operational standpoint that the sure. bottom line shows you know similar growth uh, accordingly that kind of simple I, i'm oversimplifying it but that kind of value conversation isn't happening right on the whole. you isn't you it? and i are, are actually I, I feel like saying very similar things the point here is that it's not about whether you're using your your servers efficiently. It's whether or not you are able to adapt your organization to use your technology spend effectively, right? And and there's a point at which you can come back and say, every dollar I put into IT translates into this much more revenue. That's awesome. At the same time, you want to say, can I put those dollars in and get more dollars out from a revenue side. So you want to spend, you want to spend the investment efficiently, right? And you also want to spend it proportionally. I, I don't, I agree with you. Just, just 
circling the wagons and trying to pull everything back to control costs is not a winning strategy. And from what we see, right, it's, it's companies that want cloud-like behaviors, right? Resourceful IT, better platforms, more control, you know, and they, they are able, right? We're talking to people not because they're trying to retreat, but because they've been successful in doing that work. And, and that gives them the controls to be more heterogeneous rather than less. It's, I mean, what, what you're describing is, you know, this idea of, um, you know, it's too confusing. I can't control it. I don't understand it. You know, that, that I can, I can sympathize with that. There's a lot of complexity hidden in the infrastructures that people have. Um, and, and I think it's a, we, we need to own the fact that if you can't explain the complexity to people and they can't see it because it's all hidden, this is the Jevons paradox complexity stuff that I'm trying to start articulating better, then there is a real business continuity risk of somebody pointing and saying, I don't understand cloud well enough to understand my business continuity risk from it, pull it back. I, I, at least I know the boundaries of my, my complexity space, right? That's the Texas power grid writ large, right? It, you know, it's complex. I don't understand all the failure points. Let me just generate enough power for me and I'll, I'll own it. Um, and as we see, that doesn't work either. But I, I, I think the, the question from a 2030 perspective, and we're out of time on this and want should keep going in another session, is how does this shape the decisions that we should be making going forward? Right? That's, it's, you know, these are real concerns and the heterogeneity of infrastructure, the complexity of infrastructure um, are going to continue to grow. All, right. all Even if you were all in on Amazon, it would continue to grow. I think cloud 2030, or good cloud in general, good IT in general is based on good architecture. And we don't see enough of that, or I haven't seen enough of it. Yeah, you're never going to. Sure. What you're going to see is, is bad architectures getting subsumed into long-term sustainable systems. That's the part of the Jevons complexity paradox oh. problem. S sustainable. I got to run. Sustained. Yeah. Good conversation, though. Thanks for listening to me. I always appreciate your point of view. It's good. Not that I always agree, but I always appreciate it. <laughs> Next time, don't give me the mic. <laughs> it can be arranged. All right. See Bye you everyone. later. Thank you for joining us with the Cloud 2030. What a fun conversation. Um, really has me scratching my head about how we're going to improve things um, in the cloud if we keep just adding stuff together and building whatever. Um, yeah, at some point, uh, I think there is a need for architecture, but I don't know how we're going to put the toothpaste back in that tube. So plan to brush your teeth from the counter, I guess. <laughs> Enjoy. This is fun. Please join us, the 2030.cloud. We have these conversations all the time, and I would love for you to be a part of it. Thanks.